Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar that is brand new content. It's an evolution of the methodology that we've been developing with accounting and advisory firms around the world over the past six years. If you're new to Paradox, my name's Michael Carter. Many people call me MC. I'm the founder of Practice Paradox. Today's topic is all about the content marketing cycle for accountants and advisors. So what we do at Paradox is we're inch wide, mile deep, focused on marketing for accountants and advisors using the latest technology. So we're not practice management consultants. We won't give you broad brushstroke motherhood statements. We give you very specific advice that's all about attracting clients and doing more with your existing clients. Now, a couple of things today. If you're a Twitter user, feel free to follow us. We're at Practice Paradox. And if you're savvy on using hashtags, whenever you do a tweet today, apart from mentioning at Practice Paradox, the hashtag is Paradox Now Live. If you're a newbie in Twitter, all that means is include both at Practice Paradox with no spaces and then hash Paradox Now Live in your tweets and that will show up in the Twitter stream for anyone who's following that online. So thank you for registering today. The focus of today are 10 steps for attracting your ideal clients. Now, content marketing is the modern new way of marketing. We were pioneers in this space uh, more than six years ago when we first started speaking at events such as the Accountants Technology Showcase. And people thought we were a little bit off our tree teaching firms how to use Twitter and social media and blogging. And we had people say, what are you doing that's not relevant to accounting firms and business advisors? But times have changed. Clearly, you know better than that. And today we will give you a 10 step process that shows you in a really structured, measurable, pragmatic way, how to do modern marketing. And the good thing is with this approach is that pragmatic aspect. It's not about creativity. You're not going to hear about um, marketing for pretty pictures. You know, we don't have anyone here who has a ponytail like the creative ad agencies who think it's all about the next great creative ad idea. In fact, this style of marketing involves no spend on marketing. Now, as we look at those 10 steps today, we'll also look at the biggest marketing mistakes that we continue to see firms that are in the accounting and business advisory space make in relation to their marketing. And it's our role at Paradox is to teach firms how to do best practices in marketing and also actually help you implement those things. And lastly, one of the hottest topics I think in business right now, but most certainly in marketing, is marketing automation. And be ready to have your mind blown if you've never been exposed to the whole concept of marketing automation before. It's one of the highest ROI activities that any small business, yours included, and actually your SME business clients can possibly do. So let's start with a poll just to get an idea of who's with us today. I'll just make the poll live. 30% of you selected knowing where to start. Now, the first of the 10 steps that we'll run through today addresses that. 40% having the resources people to do it. The biggest one, jumping off the page there, almost 60% the time needed to create content. Because I think the concepts of content-driven marketing, once you're exposed to them, are clear, they're understandable. But yes, uh, in the style of business that you're in, often being deadline driven, uh, time it can be a scarce commodity. The skill and then the technology aspects. Interesting, I would have thought the technology aspects may have rated higher, um, but that's good. Thanks for um, sharing that. So time is number one, then not far behind that, the skill and the resources. And 70% of you feel you know where to start which is brilliant. Now here's the model of the content marketing cycle. You can see five steps across the top, strategy, presence, publish, attract, convert. And the purpose of those five steps in the content marketing cycle is to grow your marketing database. And we'll talk why that's strategically important a little later. Now the bottom five, automate, nurture, invite, sell, and onboard result in you building a client base, a very specific client base 
of your ideal clients. Now, every single one of these steps is an area of marketing that you can learn, that you can master, and in nine out of 10 cases, you can measure. When I presented this at a conference, uh, I did a keynote in Fiji a few months ago, uh, someone remarked, and I mentioned it in my email yesterday, that it demystified marketing for them. And my hope for you today is that you'll feel exactly the same. So the first step is getting clear on your strategy. I'll share with you some things that strategy are not. It's not about differentiation. It's not about having a unique selling proposition. The good old USP, if you've heard that talked about. Sadly, uh, differentiation from a strategic perspective means actually being differentiated. It means having something different in terms of your resources, your technology, your business model. Now, I don't know about you, but the last time I looked at most accounting firms, they're hiring from the same labor pool with the same business model using the same or similar apps. And from a strategic perspective, they're not truly differentiated. So saying you're different or better or the best is a waste of time. It's blah, 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 but everyone does it. It doesn't work. It's more about positioning. And positioning is not about saying you're better or you're different. It's more about saying uh, what you do and who you deal with. There's a brilliant book called Blue Ocean Strategy that uses the metaphor of don't thrash about in the bloodied waters of competition. Instead, find a patch of blue ocean that essentially is an available market segment or a niche. And today we won't go into how to do that and make those decisions because that's what we do in module one of the Modern Marketing Academy. We show you how you can combine four different elements in multiple ways. So whether that's industry, occupation, demographic, psychographic in terms of who they are and how they think, you can combine them in many different ways. So there's no one way to stand out in the marketplace. Now this is an interesting one. Strategy is not an objective. If that seems like a statement of the obvious, Consider this, we survey accounting firms frequently. When I speak at conferences, when we do our marketing gap analyses with people, which is um, a questionnaire that we get people to complete when they're thinking about working with us. And when we ask them, what is your strategy? More than 90% of the time, the answer given is not a strategy, it's an objective. It's a statement of an outcome in terms of percentage growth, number of clients. That is not a strategy. That's where you want to get. The strategy is how you're going to get there. Now, we're the only people that we know that teach strategy in the way that we teach it to accounting firms. Uh, it is a waste of time to focus on uh, for massive growth. You've got to get your house in order. Practice managers, management's important. Marketing will uh, magnify what it is that you do. But firms, um, some of the firms that we've worked with, uh, four out of the seven zero partners of the year in Australia are people that have either graduated from our Modern Marketing Academy at Paradox or we've done their marketing for them. So firms like GrowthWise, who've doubled their revenue five years running now, um, said that when they got clear on their strategy, they went from being paralyzed in their marketing and knowing what to do next, because they had lots of ideas, to being very focused and very effective. Um, same with OTM Group, for example. OTM Group is a fairly young firm, only a couple of years old now. And they came to us when they were quite young and they wanted to do more self-managed super fund setups. And by getting really clear on their strategy in terms of who they were targeting, very clear on their business model and making it scalable and how they were going to deliver that, um, they've been able to grow from doing one self-managed super fund setup a week when they first came to us and they're now averaging five. That's their monthly target is 20 and they hit that most months. So until they had the strategy though, they were like most firms, you know, thinking marketing is getting their name out there or pounding the pavement or doing networking. All of that is very low um, ROI, low leverage. So strategy is the difference between night and day. Now strategy is not something that you delegate. This is a common thing that we see where leaders within a firm think that, oh, we'll hire a marketing coordinator and they can look after the marketing. They'll do our blogging, they'll do our social media. We don't need to be involved. Wrong. Marketing is something that from a strategic level, the leaders of the firm need to understand. You don't have to do it, but you need to guide it. You need to keep your hands on the steering wheel. Now, luckily strategy is not complex, but like many things in life, it's not necessarily easy initially. 
which is why we guide people through the decisions they need to make to get really clear on their strategy because having a clear strategy does involve saying no. You succeed by saying no and by limiting what it is that uh, who you're trying to attract and sometimes often limiting what it is that you deliver. But it is not complex and once you get it right, it's right and it does make everything very easy. But it is not common, um, which is one of the reasons we can get good results quickly with firms is when they get a cut through strategy. But it does require discipline and focus. If you find yourself not saying no to prospective clients from time to time, it means you either don't have a strategy or you don't have the discipline to apply it. So having a strategy is one thing, sticking to it is another. So you need to have that discipline and focus. So marketing mistake number one that we see is abdication instead of delegation. Abdication, you handle it. And by the way, abdication can also happen to um, a marketing agency like Paradox. We're a full service marketing agency and the alarm bells go off for us when we see that people don't want to learn. So by virtue of the fact you're at this webinar, that's a good thing. Because occasionally we talk to people that say, look, no, I'm not interested in investing an hour a month to go through the learning in the academy, not interested in coming along to your marketing masterclasses. So unless they're already strongly marketing savvy, that is warning bells. Because the style of marketing that we teach positions the leaders in the firm as thought leaders. And that starts with thoughts from the leaders. So you can't just wipe your hands of that and allow someone else to do it. So you have the, the seed of understanding the strategies and the ideas and the things that you feel strongly about. And that is when your marketing machine rolls from there. But delegation is understanding it and building a team, building a workflow of people within your firm and also specialists outside the firm that you properly delegate to. So that's the first part, strategy within the content marketing cycle. By the way, feel free, we'll have question time later, feel free to send uh, questions uh, through and we'll have a look at those a little later on. Next, presence. One of my favorite quotes by uh, Woody Allen is that 80% of success in life is showing up. Made me laugh, made me think of my university days. 80% of the time I did show up. But with marketing, we're seeing firms that don't even have um, a digital footprint, meaning they're not there. They haven't shown up. Uh, for example, their website, apart from being poorly designed, is not mobile responsive. Now, if your website is not mobile responsive, you may have heard that um, it was named Mobile Ageddon, um, so that when Google started penalizing non-mobile sites, uh, more than two thirds of search through Google and other search engines is done on mobile devices now. And if your site is not mobile responsive, Google will not show it. It will only show the mobile responsive sites, which is one step beyond being mobile friendly. So it's not a mobile version of your site, like some misguided website providers do. It's your same website that based on the width and type of screen that it's on, it will rearrange itself, for example, into one easy column for someone to just flick through with their thumb. So that's one part of your digital footprint. Other parts, uh, one of the services that we provide is called SEO implementation. So the search engine optimization to help you rank really well high up on page one of Google. And this has happened twice now, uh, one with a capital city firm, one with a regional firm, and it's happened just within the last month or so, where our SEO team, and we have two types of SEO operatives, um, SEO has a technical perspective, techies, but it also has a copywriting perspective. You never want to let SEO people loose on your website that are not working side by side with copywriters who make sure that it still reads well because an SEO person can wreck your site. They might make it rank well in Google, but if it's not good to read, you lose. But here, the, the my business um, is the profile that like it or not, you've got one. Um, and most firms that when they first come to us have not completed it fully. And by completed, it's not just things like having the um, cover page and the banner graphics and your little avatar image set up, that's important. But there are things like um, hours of operation, physical address, there's a verification process. Um, it, it seems strange, but in this day and age in Google, but Google will actually send you, um, a, it's like a postcard, a letter, to your physical address with a code that you need to enter to verify that that is actually your bricks and mortar address. 
If you don't do that, you are penalized in Google. So we saw sites go from being page three of Google, may as well not even be there, to very quickly um, then reaping the benefits of what we'd done in SEO and being number one, two or three for their target phrase. Social media profiles completed. I wish I had a dollar for every LinkedIn profile I've seen that's incomplete. You know, it doesn't have full work history, doesn't have any recommendations. Also LinkedIn company pages. If you're going to have a, a social media profile, complete it number one and give it some thought. If you need help in completing it, you know, lean on some outside providers, some copywriters, and we have a whole team of copywriters to help with that sort of thing. Um, social media accounts branded. Don't be an egghead in Twitter. If you've got a Twitter account and your little avatar, the little image next to your updates is just um, a block of color with an egg on it, it means you haven't uploaded an image of yourself. Now this all goes to building your digital footprint, your presence when people look for you online. A quick little tip, and it's one of dozens that we give members, is if you haven't set up an account, it's free, on gravatar.com. And what you do there is you link your email addresses, say your work email address, if you want personal email addresses, to your account, upload an image, and then when you do blog post comments, for example, on our site, if you comment under the blog, if you don't see an image of yourself, that means that um, you either haven't set up a Gravatar um, account or you didn't fill out the field such as um, website address or email address when you did your blog comments. Why does that matter? Lots of reasons, apart from the one that we're talking about here with your presence and your digital footprint and being visible online. Every time you do a blog comment, it actually creates a backlink to your site. So a hyperlink back to your site that if it's on a, a high quality site, increases your uh, SEO in terms of your Google rankings. So that's presence. Many mistakes in here, but to summarize, the marketing mistake number two, digital footprints incomplete and amateur. It's just not finished and it looks rubbish. So you gotta look good. To be a remarkable firm, one of the models that we talk about is three things that you need to be. You've got to look great, you've got to sound great, and lastly, you've got to be great. So look great's important, otherwise people won't even hear your message. So that's your branding, the mobile responsive website, looking great in social media, um, and the sound great is your content that we'll talk about later. And be great means delivering and actually being good at delivering on the promises. Crucial that there's a... Uh, uh, integrity between all of those. So next, publishing. Marketing, if you've come to our webinars, if you're a member of Paradox, you would have heard us talk about, forget about marketing, think more about education. Certainly these days, not about promotion. Uh, last I saw on, in the data, only about 18% of people place any credence or trust in advertising. So marketing now is about teaching people things. And thankfully, you're in the, a profession that lends itself perfectly to this style of marketing. So we help get that expertise and knowledge out of your head to educate your clients, prospective clients, about things that they can implement. And that creates what's called cognitive dissonance, which is an emotional discomfort. No one will buy any advisory services when they feel comfortable in their life. If they're comfortable in their business, comfortable in their finances. You're not selling any advisory services to them. But once they become aware of a gap between where they are now and where they could be, that's when they start to think, hmm, I need to do something about that. That's cognitive dissonance from a psychological perspective, and that's ethical influence. So with publishing, every business, if you've got a website, you've got a blog, um, you're publishing out into social media, you're doing email newsletters, and everything I, should, I just mentioned you should be doing every month, that's a publishing function. So a newspaper, a magazine, even online, um, publications, you know, they don't just randomly think of something and just bang it out, do they? They think about it. They have an editorial calendar. Uh, in marketing terms, sometimes it's called a content plan. So it's just a plan thinking ahead, what topics are relevant? So there's certain seasonalities based on time of the year, based on, in your business, based on say, uh, deadlines. There might be tax planning year, there's certain compliance deadlines, that's on one level, but there's other times of the year when people might be reflective about the progress they've made or haven't made over the past year, maybe at the end of the year. And at the start of the year, they might be reflective about setting their goals. So there's certain seasons that you can think through and go, right, as that relates to what we do, I'm gonna write about this. So every business is a publisher and you need to develop that competency and those resources. Content, for those of you still thinking, oh, that's a bit 
broad, amorphous. Website, blog posts, email newsletters we've mentioned, anything you put out in the social media. Video, video is a great way for accelerating trust because you can see the whites of people's eyes. Webinars are a form of video. You can record your webinars and create video. Audio is also good, it's a lot easier than video. Uh, it doesn't suit everyone, but that's another medium. Also surveying the marketplace, doing polls, uh, and then doing infographics about your findings, publishing those, doing white papers, eBooks, all of that is content. And all of that is just different forms of your ideas. So that's the key, is to develop yourself, your position as authority to your audience. Who's your audience? That's who you decided you wanna be renowned and um, highly regarded to, and the guru in step one strategy. So why is your strategy so important is you need to match not just your content, but the channels. Not all social media, media accounts or platforms are appropriate, are they? You might think my clients are not in Facebook. Other people I know in firms go, actually they are in Facebook, or certainly the spouses of our target market are in Facebook and they often help with the bookkeeping or whatever it might be. So you don't have to spread yourself across all social media platforms. You pick the ones that have the best match and you do them properly and consistently with a blend of in-house resources and where needed, uh, additional external resources. For example, we have our social media update service, which helps you with content curation. And we've got some really exciting innovations in that space um, coming up next month as well, which I won't go into now. Okay, so that's publishing. The mistake that we see here, marketing mistake number three, is there's two things in here. Not consistently publishing great content. So consistency is key. Again, I wish I had a dollar for every time I went to a page on a website that said, subscribe to our monthly newsletter or weekly newsletter, and then it hasn't been done for months. Um, that's fairly common. But notice the word there, great. Here's a trick question telling you in advance. What's the difference in response that poor content, bad content gets, and good content in marketing? What would you think is the, the difference? Well, the trick is there's no difference because there's no response. There is so much content being published that good content gets ignored. Poor content goes without saying, gets ignored and probably tarnishes you. But in terms of response, neither will get a response. Your content's gotta be great. So your content needs to be non-obvious. Where possible, contrarian. Great headlines. So that the headline of your article, even the wording of a LinkedIn update, or a Twitter tweet is, is a headline. And all of those things um, grab people's attention and then feed traffic through to your website, which we'll talk about uh, very shortly. So we've gone strategy, presence, publish. Next, let's talk about attract. Attracting targeted traffic. Now when you do targeted content, it attracts your target markets. It's a waste of time being in social media, being a general accountant and business advisory firm, targeting small business. Because I'm only a tad facetious with this. Um, the small business market does not exist. It does not exist in a form that's easily reached in a way that you can stand out to them. Because if you ask someone in a business what they do, probably not very common they would say, I'm a small business operator. Instead, they'll say, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a builder, I'm a carpenter, I'm a dentist. So the more specific you are in the different verticals and market segments that you're targeting, the better content you can do that A, connects with them, resonates, I'm kind of a bit over that word, but you know, connects with them so they feel, you're talking exactly to me. Like with some of our blog posts, we've had comments where people have said, um, we've been saying to each other in the firm here that you've been spying on us and walking around our firm because we're speaking directly to the issues that we know accounting and business advisory firms have. Uh, a recent blog post that many of you I know saw was the one about um, boring versus not boring branding for accountants. And that's a very specific topic, but branding for small business, oh, millions of people writing about that. Branding for accountants that blog post, only two weeks old, is now number one in Google. And that's because it's targeting what's called a long tail phrase. A long tail phrase is a more specific, naturally worded phrase that is not only a couple of words, that's very broad and everyone's going after it. That's, that's a guaranteed way to fail 
in content marketing. But we'll talk more about that in other webinars. So targeted content will, like the, the icon there of the magnet, your content is attracting like iron filings to you due to its specificity. It's hard word to say, hard to spell too, but write that one down, specificity. If your content's not specific, it's probably just bland and having no effect. Now, when your SEO focused content, that's building your website traffic. So traffic, you know, how many people, how many unique visitors are coming to your site? How many are returning visitors? How many are just finding you by searching on problems? And that um, branding for accountants blog post, we put what's called a lead magnet. So something of value that people want to download. Last time I looked into our marketing automation platform, and I'll explain more about that later on, I think that's generated 48 new leads for us. And we didn't um, go and publish a brochure. It was not hard sell. It was educational. It shared case studies, examples. So that's very specific and SEO focused. And when you consistently publish good content over a period of time, you build your position of authority. Now I've got a confession to make. I could write a blog post called Confessions of a Lazy Marketer. And in fact, one of our really good members, um, Ben Walker from Inspire CA, said to me yesterday, MC, yeah, I was worried about Paradox. I haven't heard from you guys. We, this year, this calendar year, we have been so busy and growing so strongly because we keep getting leads, inquiries coming in every day based on what we've done in the past. If you Google marketing for accountants in multiple countries, we are number one, didn't happen overnight, but did not happen by accident. So we've built that position of authority and that's exactly what we teach you to do. And the nice thing is it's like priming a pump. Um, or it's like getting a siphon going. It's a bit of work at the start, but then things flow. Now you need to know your website traffic volume and trends. If I was to say to you right now, how many visitors do you get to your website? How many did you have last month? I know with some exceptions that you wouldn't be able to answer me. And also what's the trend? Is it flat? Is it growing? You need to know that. There are easy ways to find that out. Uh, easy once you know how. You can log into Google Analytics. We sometimes have people come to us who've had a website built by someone else. We build websites as well. And Google Analytics has not even been set up. <sighs> You know, what you can measure, you can manage. You need to focus on the data. So much in marketing is measurable and therefore improvable, if there's such a word. So you can log into Google Analytics, but that can be quite um, overwhelming when you first look at it. There's dozens of places you can look within it. You almost need a degree to understand it to some extent, which is why one of the things that we've started doing that people are loving is a dashboard that summarizes your most important marketing metrics about your website, about your e-newsletters, about your LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, whatever it is that you might use. We put it all on the one page. So you can see without having to log in to six different places and do 28 different clicks, okay, what's working, what's not. So you've got to know it. If you don't know it, you're not focusing on it and it won't be improving. Another thing, know what people are searching on to find you. One of the things that we put onto the marketing metrics dashboard for people is the um, phrases. It's called organic search or sometimes it's called natural search. So these are people that have searched on something in Google and just happened to find you. They didn't click on a link, say on in your email footer, or they didn't um, just type in your address. They, they discovered you. So you can actually see what are the phrases that people are searching on and then you can go, that's interesting. People are searching on that. Let's do a blog post about that. Let's build on that. Quick example, in our circles, when I say our collectively, you know, I know a lot looking at the attendee list. A lot of you love technology, you love innovation. One of the reasons you may have been attracted to what we do. And big on the cloud, you know, you love cloud-based apps like Xero and its app ecosystem. But when you look in the data on volume of searches, even though firms, we know firms have been targeting um, phrases with their blogging that are about cloud accounting and cloud this, cloud that. The average mum and dad out there or the average small business um, operator out there does three times as many searches on something related. Online accounting software. They don't use the word cloud. That's industry jargon that we've been taught to use. So the data really, really matters and you can leverage off the back of that doesn't mean you can't have blog posts and pages on your website that are targeting the phrase that uses cloud, but you can have others that target 
online accounting software for, and then get specific, for building companies, for dentists, whatever it might be. Now paid traffic, so that's search engine marketing where there's the pay per click advertising. Uh, that's valid, that's relevant. It's very good for testing. Uh, it's very good for testing web pages to see which converts the best, won't go into that, but that's another way of generating traffic to your website. But understand that no website traffic means no marketing momentum. It means you probably don't have a good presence online. It means you're not publishing, people aren't finding you, they're not talking about you, they're not clicking on your social media. You're standing still, not good. So marketing mistake number four is not tracking marketing metrics. And there's lots of them, but such as traffic. But there's another one, a really important one that I wanna talk about next. And that's convert. When we build a marketing metrics dashboard for a firm, one of the um, metrics that we display is called conversion rate. Uh, in Google Analytics, there's things you can set up. You can set up one, 10, 20 of them if you want. Conversion goals, which are what you want people to do when they come to your site. So website traffic to use an analogy is like water flowing into a bucket, your bucket and you want the water coming in. But without a website that's converting, your bucket has holes. The water is just dribbling out the bottom. You might have a gaping hole or lots of little ones. But when you have a website that's converting, that means that the visitors coming to your website are opting in, so giving their permission to receive further information. Now the most obvious and lame way to do that that doesn't work that well for conversion is subscribe to our free e-newsletter. Oh great. Last thing most people want is yet another email newsletter, which is why specific lead magnets that might be eBooks or increasingly more, de um, more detailed and um, briefer pieces of information work better. So that one page checklist on boring versus not boring branding checklist that we published is following these principles. So we apply to our own business what we teach to you. So that's a really powerful thing to have people come to your website uh, be impressed with what they see, with what they read, and then they go, I like you, I trust you enough to let you come into my email inbox, which is a very personal place, it really is. It's a position of trust for them to allow it. That's so easy to measure conversion goals that um, easily 95% of the firms that have come to us that haven't had a website done by us have had no conversion goals when they've come to us. That's like jumping in a car and spending you know, people spend five, 10, 15, $20,000 on a website. That's like buying, you know, really good four wheel drive and go, all right, we're off. Okay, where are we going? Don't know, we're just headed west. At least west is some direction. With no conversion goals, you've got no purpose to your website. So another thing that I'll share in future webinars with some case studies, there are conversion tools that greatly enhance your conversion rate percentage. So a conversion tool is something like, if you look at our website, Practice Plus, Sorry, um, Practice Plus is someone that does good websites. Practiceparadox.com.au. Um, There's a green stripe across the top. That's an example of a conversion tool. That's one called Hello Bar. So that's hellobar.com. And you can promote an ebook or a downloadable or something that your target market is likely to be interested in. They click on it, they download it, they end up on your email list and then that's the start of it, and I'll explain the process further from there. But if you're not converting, you're losing. So it is the purpose of your website. So that's really crucial. Now, it's one thing to have conversion goals, and you might go, yes, we've got a conversion goal, but if there's one conversion goal, and it's for people to subscribe to your e-newsletter, it's a start, but it's a bit lame. Uh, it's unlikely to be as effective as specific lead magnets targeting specific audiences about specific problems or opportunities. So that's marketing mistake number five, not tracking and optimizing website conversions. By the way, I mentioned Hello Bar. There's others like Lead Boxes, which is a function within Lead Pages. Uh, there's Sumo Me, there's um, uh, Optin Monster, uh, there's a whole bunch. Uh, there's certain ones that we recommend that work really well with WordPress sites but you don't have to use a lot of them, you can just start using them. And they allow you to test different wording of the headline. And you can see, isn't that interesting? People are clicking on this one far more than that one. So one might have a better headline or more contrarian, non-obvious angle on the wording, or it might just be a different color button. That word optimizing there, before I mentioned SEO, 
search engine optimization, which I hope you're familiar with. God, I was at a conference recently and a marketing expert stood up and went, SEO, that stands for, and had a whole slide on what SEO stood for. I thought, I think I'm in the wrong room. But that's a whole area of specialty. Um, it's inch wide, mile deep in and of itself, which is why we have a specialized team just on that. Um, but there's another area called CRO. This is the area of marketing called conversion rate optimization. Totally different skill set, and it's about test and measure, test and measure, and understanding the technology and the science and the psychology to make websites and web pages, landing pages, convert better. And it dramatically improves the return on investment you get from your online um, activity. So that's the first five steps. As I mentioned at the outset, the goal there is to grow your database. So when we say your database, often in my online marketing terminology, it's just called your list. And don't go buying a list, oh my goodness. We have had a number of people come to us and said, oh look, we're part of X, XYZ well-known coaching group. And one of the first things they told us to do was to go out and buy a list. Do you think we should do that? I've got a list here, it's $5,000. We say, stop, do not buy a list. You are far better off with a list that you've grown yourself by publishing targeted content, to a specific audience, attracting, converting, and then being able to nurture a list of 50, or frankly even five, than buying a list of 50 strangers. And you're not even allowed to email a bought list anyway. Uh, you could do direct mail, uh, there's a gray area around faxing, but basically they don't know you anyway. So grow a list, my little joke is it's like a beard. You know, grow your own, buying it doesn't work as well. So your list equals email subscribers, but it does also include your social media networks. So that's your connections in LinkedIn, first level, even further. Um, your connections in Twitter and also the audience that you reach by using hashtags and at mentioning influencers. Uh, but it's also audiences, this is a really exciting area called retargeting or remarketing where you, you can drop a pixel uh, on a visitor to a certain website and then even though they're not an email subscriber, you can choose to put certain ads and messages in front of them. You don't wanna um, bludgeon them to death with the same ads all over the place, that's just annoying. But you can stay in front of these people um, with you know, a good message, if it's specific and targeted to them, and they haven't even opted into your list, but it's kind of your list. But email is, even though it's not fashionable or sexy, it's more valuable now than a social media list. And the goal of your social media activity is to drive traffic to your website, to get them to convert, to get them on your email list. Now your list should be 10 to 20 times, if not more, the number of people that you have in your client base. So if you've got 100 clients, you know, you should have 1,000, 2,000 people on your list. If you're a startup, well, you'll get there, but that is so achievable. And we've helped many, many firms do that. Um, the gentleman I mentioned before, Ben Walker, inspireca.com, Brisbane-based sole practitioner. Um, yeah, he shared with me a screenshot where his CRM, um, his marketing automation platform that we guided him on, um, in the previous 30 days had grown by 90 people. So 90 opt-ins where people had seen him in social media, they're very active in their Facebook group, they're targeting young families that have certain types of businesses, so that's quite specific have come to his website, read his blogs, and maybe downloaded one of his eBooks. Again, a strategy that we taught him, not just on the content, but on the technology. So I think we would all love 90 effectively fresh leads. Now when we say leads, they haven't inquired yet, but they've said, I wanna to get to know you better. So this is a fact, um, plenty of intellectual property lawyers uh, I know we'll verify this, your list is a balance sheet asset, particularly when it's a large responsive list because you can show that when I email this list, here's what happens. And we've got that data ourselves. Like without leaving my chair, I'm in front of 121 people without leaving my chair. And that came from having a list of people that over time have liked what we're about and wanna learn more. So it's the same with what you do. So marketing mistake, number five, is not focusing on growing your marketing database. And that sort of mistake is evidenced by having your call to action, uh, you know, the main thing you want a visitor to your website to do is 
book a complimentary consultation, free consultation. You know, all these other, um, we never do that in the websites that we build, but plenty of people do it. You've only just met this website visitor. The chances of them wanting to sit in front of you for half an hour or more is kind of slim on their first visit for reasons that we'll talk about shortly. So the front end of your marketing database is about growing a specific marketing database. Okay. Next step, automate. If you like technology, if you like leverage, and the tagline for Paradox is marketing, innovation, leverage. Leverage is one of the wonders of the world. It is the difference between, if the strategy and business model's there, leverage is the difference between a struggling business operator and one that not only succeeds, but doesn't seem to try that hard. Uh, a firm in Bathurst recently said to me, MC, we're growing and we're not even trying. Perfect, because we've got leverage working for them. So leverage is amplifying your results without amplifying your output or your effort. Uh, so marketing automation, picture this. Imagine you had on your team a salesperson. If the word sales makes your skin crawl because you're a professional services um, advisor, think of um, a a rainmaker, a business development manager, BDM, someone who generates business. And imagine they worked for you and they never slept. And imagine you had a number of these people. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they went through your list looking for opportunities to send people useful, relevant, timely information. Now, are they mind readers? No. That criteria of will it be uh, deemed to be relevant and useful and is it timely is based on what each individual clicked on. So whether that was say in an email or on your website or in a web form, even in social media, what did they open? What didn't they open? What did they watch? Did they watch the video all the way through? Um, or didn't they watch it at all? What pages did they visit on the website? How long did they spend on that page about business planning on the web page? Wow they might be interested in more information on business planning. So that'd be pretty cool if you had, let's say three people doing that all week for you. Well, that is precisely what marketing automation does for you. Um, it's incredibly exciting, high ROI uh, area of marketing that we're helping people with. Now, if you're a member of our Modern Marketing Academy, you'll know well this metaphor of the conveyor belt of influence. So that's our metaphor for bringing a new subscriber who's opted in to your list along a series of steps. So they might read a blog post and then they might download a related ebook and then they might watch a video of you explaining it, standing at the whiteboard or a video of you presenting. And then they might think, geez, I like what these guys are about. And then they get an email from you saying, hey, webinar, I might attend that. And then you offer a next step after the webinar of say submitting a gap analysis or something that will add value to them and will help you assess where they're at. And by the way, will create cognitive dissonance in their mind. So that's just a random example. Now in the back end of a system like Infusionsoft, which is a CRM, it's an email broadcast system, but most importantly, it's a marketing and business automation platform. You can actually see for each contact, everything that they've ever done. You can see what pages they've been to your website, what emails they've opened, they haven't opened, what web forms on your website they've, um, visited, completed, abandoned. It's very good information used ethically. It just helps you deliver that information to the right people at the right time. So marketing mistake number six is not building marketing automation systems. One of the nice things about marketing automation is it's effective for educating both your existing clients and future clients, you know, your prospective clients on your list or your hopper, as we call it in the Modern Marketing Academy. Because what you're sending out is not sell, sell, sell. Um, it's good quality, educational, thought leadership, often maybe even inspiring, believe it or not, inspiring information that makes people want to implement what you're talking about. But the nice thing is that you can build these automated processes in Infusionsoft and tools like it that not only help with your marketing, but can help you deliver operational and service delivery communications, which is another topic for another day. I think Infusionsoft undersells itself as marketing automation, because it does much more than that. But cleverly, they're focusing their message 
to marketing automation. So that's automate. Now that's the technology. The next thing you need to do then is nurture your list. We all know people buy from those they know, like, and trust. It's not enough to be a trusted advisor. Some of you may have read our ebook about the fact that why being a trusted advisor is nowhere near enough. And we know for a fact that even though the accounting profession in most societies is the number one most trusted uh, advisory profession when it comes to finances, only one out of um, 10 accounting firms does much um, non-compliance advisory work, despite wanting to. So you can be trusted, but you're probably not necessarily delivering a lot of advisory work. They've got to feel like they know you and they've got to like you. So this is a gradual process over time. It's not a flick of a switch. You don't start blogging and all of a sudden um, overnight, you know, you've got 30 new clients. But over the course of a year, that most definitely happens. So the nurturing process is that helpful, insightful um, education that builds that trust. Now note, I said insightful. So that's where great content comes in. It can't be obvious stuff that they look at the headline or the subject line of the email and go, yeah, yeah, I know I should do that. It's got to make people go, oh, is that right? Interesting. That's unusual coming from an accountant. Um, lots of examples we can share on that. GrowthWise, who I mentioned earlier, who list us as their number one influence on their success over the past five years. They list Paradox as number one, and happily they list Zero as number two. We love Zero, but it's nice to beat them in something. Um, and Steph told a story in a webinar with members once about the fact that a brand new member who just signed up to a full range of advisory and compliance services said, yes, yeah, Steph, you've taught me so much. I've been reading your blog and the light bulb went on for me when I read your article about why the number one asset for a business owner is data. Because she said, number one, I thought, what's an accountant saying that? I thought you were gonna say my premises or you know, my cash reserves or whatever it might be or my team. Uh, I thought, Data, what are you talking about? And you educated me about the efficiencies that are available by building um, integrated cloud-based apps to you know, eliminate data entry and ban admin in my business. That's thought leadership right there. So th those insights is what it's about. So you position yourself as an authority. Look how similar the words author and authority are. You publish good content, you're instantly um, perceived as an authority, but then gradually build your level of authority over time. Now keep in mind that when someone changes advisors, they don't do it lightly, they don't do it haphazardly, it's kind of like breaking up. So they might watch you from afar for months, maybe longer. So by having this graduated process where your marketing automation can send them the right information based on interests they've indicated through their behaviors already, either explicitly or implicitly, gradually they'll just really feel like you're it that you're definitely the next cab off the rank for them when the timing's right. For example, they might wait for the end of financial year to be rounded out and then they're gonna come visit you. So nurture is the key. It's not sell, sell, sell. Great content via email, but the emails then send traffic to your website, out into your social media, to your videos, which might be on say YouTube or Vimeo or embedded on your website as well. And here's where the rubber hits the road for you you get pre-educated, warm inquiries. So they already understand what you're about. You don't need to sell them on you, the firm, what you stand for, your values, they've picked that up already. So they're ready to be advised, which means they're ready to buy. There's a well-quoted statistic because various studies have quoted it over time. I'm sure you've heard this. People buy after five positive interactions or touches. Touches makes my skin crawl a little bit, but five interactions where they think that was good. So something on your site, something in social media. Now, if you know that psychology, that's why marketing automation is so brilliant. You just use technology to um, put that psychology in your favor with your digital, online, social, content driven, and your marketing automation. And those hearts there along your conveyor belt of influence are those warm referrals. And we know for a fact that this style of incoming inquiry is better than a typical referral. It is. No, I'm not saying all referrals, but better than the typical referral because to this point, before they've inquired, you have controlled the message. With a referral, sometimes they can be told very little and sometimes they be, be, can be told something you don't even want them to be told by your existing client or referral partner. It might be, go see Sally, go see Tom. You know, they're really good and they don't charge a lot. 
what the? Um, whereas when they've come along your conveyor belt, they've really understood that you're about um, future focused advisory services and that you're about their future, not just their last quarter last year. And that is true. I know it seems con uh, contrary on the surface, but we experience that ourselves all the time. Cold referrals, not nearly as good as someone that's read our blog posts, watched our videos, come to our webinars, because you're on the same page. Marketing mistake number seven is not building list nurturing systems and great content. So that's, you can build those systems. It's one thing to have Infusionsoft, you can pay money for Infusionsoft and we're certified Infusionsoft partners. We're happy to demonstrate Infusionsoft to you, but it's just a tool. You've got to have that great content based on strategy. It always comes back to strategy, audience, message, and specificity. You put that into that technology and build what are called campaigns that don't send just blanket emails out, but send specific emails to specific people, you will um, generate leads while you sleep. So that's nurture. Now look, sooner or later, you've got, you've got to ask the girl or the boy out on a, on a date. So the next step is to invite. So ask them to step, take some action. Now, people are silently begging to be led. I love that saying. They're silently begging to be led. So they won't come out and say, please lead me. But if you lead, many will follow. So they'll take action when you ask. So you invite people that are showing that they've come along certain steps. How's this? In Infusionsoft, there's a brilliant function called lead scoring, which you can say when someone does this, rate them one flame. There's a little icon of five flames that look like a little matchstick head. And you can rate your five, four, three flame leads. And it, it all happens automatically behind the scenes. So you might say, once someone gets to four flames, invite them to our next workshop on cash flow management or whatever it might be. So a natural next step based on their interests and behaviors. Events and workshops are great. Um, ben, who I um, mentioned earlier, who I saw yesterday, um, he's doing one workshop a week, generating heaps of new leads through his blogging and social media. And on average, he's getting 17, 18 people into those workshops. He's really building a community, which is something that we often talk about. Building a client base is one thing. Building a community is the next level, which really, as an advisor, is incredibly satisfying because you are really shifting people's beliefs, their behaviors, and therefore the quality of their business and their life. Webinars are good as well. And the good thing about webinars is you can practice on yourself. You can practice on a staff member, a family member, a pet. Uh, it's very easy to do webinars and you can practice in a very low um, risk and low pressure way. But it's all the same content, just delivered in different ways. Inviting people to a third party event is okay. And I'm gonna tell you about a third party event shortly um, and some other events that we're running that would be great for you to bring people along to that are your tech savvy business clients. So the events are educational, yes, but events do something that can't be done on a page as easily and they create energy, they create if any of you have seen the Australian movie, uh, The Castle, uh, it's all about the vibe. It's about the energy. And the energy in the room is something specific to events that you, is very difficult to create on the screen and online. Anyone who comes to our master classes, and we have plenty of members that have never missed one, and we've got our sixth one coming up in December, that's a big part that they love. Um, the you know, content's everywhere, but when you get together with a bunch of like-minded people wanting to achieve similar things, it really adds to the experience and the momentum you get. So the events that you do further builds that knowing, liking, and trusting. And look, you can have a call to action at the end of an event, but you don't have to. Um, but the next action might be a small step, some introductory service, some hour long, three hour long planning or consulting session that allows someone to put a toe in the water and do business with you in a small way to see how good you are. So marketing mistake number eight, and I'm seeing we've got another four and a half minutes left. We might go three minutes over, but we'll aim to keep it to that. Marketing mistake number eight, not running events consistently off the back of a nurture and list building system. You can see how easy it is for firms like Inspire CA, like GrowthWise to fill rooms consistently because they've got lots of website traffic, they're converting it, they're nurturing it, they're educating, inspiring, and leading those people. So that's invite. Sorry to use that old four letter word. I know plenty of people find the word sell offensive. Many professionals at first sometimes think they're above it. And the reason I joke about that is because I used to feel that way. 
That's the thing. I don't sell anything to anyone. I'm a professional. I have multiple degrees, postgrads, masters. Sales is for people who are not educated and couldn't get a decent career. Sadly, I learned that's not true. I've heard many an entrepreneur quote this. Nothing happens until somebody sells something. doesn't matter if you're an advisor, a software startup. I've been involved in software startups, medical device startups, consulting businesses. Nothing happens until somebody does sell something indeed. But it is one of the biggest skill gaps in business advisors, accountants in particular. You can be great at delivering the jobs, not always great in getting the jobs, which is why most people are reactive. They'll do advisory works that fall in their lap. But there's such scope there when you learn how to market and sell. But you must have a structured sales process. It needs to be documented in a flow chart with here's what the prospective customer does. Here's what our client services coordinator does. Here's what the advisor does. Here's what the technology does. And that's something that um, we love advising firms around because it works. You can go from being a proposal chaser to a proposal converter in the actual meetings with people. Now, a process is one thing. You've got to get trained in sales process and sales skills, but I'd say that's less important than sales process. You've got to get that process right. And one thing that we teach in the module in our Modern Marketing Academy that we call the three-stage filter is that the first step of your sales process is to sell your sales process. So the first conversation explains the process that you'll step them through. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, we love collaborative scoping and pricing tools such as uh, Practice Ignition. Um, excuse me while I just take a quick sip. Uh, quick hands up from people if you're using Practice Ignition in your business. PI as it's often affectionately um, termed. So who's put their hand up there? Alex, Elizabeth, Joe. And it's, it's a great tool, Sean, Terry, but it's far less useful unless you've got a really good sales process and you've structured your um, services really well so that you're using it to its best ability. So we can guide you on that as well. Uh, but those, those tools allow real-time scoping and pricing in the meeting um, live with the prospect. Can't always do that, but often you can. Now, why that's important is velocity of your sales process is crucial. It's got to keep moving. Like a sales lead, for example, um, the analogy I use is it's like a loaf of freshly baked bread. It's fresh today. It's okay tomorrow. Day three, starting to notice the difference. And gosh, I've got a number of case studies and stories where I know firms, high profile firms, some of them, where people have been referred through to the partner, partner's been a communication bottleneck, took too long to return the call, took too long to set up the meeting, took too long to get the proposal to them, and the prospect has gone elsewhere. Wasted opportunity. Now, the sales is not just about converting people to become clients. Clearly, it's also about expectation management, which is the next part. But the marketing mistake there, it's twofold. No sales process, no sales skill. Officially, we have 30 seconds left. I'm happy to stay longer for question and answer, but we've got about another three minutes of actual formal content left. It's the first time I've presented this slide deck, so timing can sometimes be a challenge for someone who's more a consultant than a presenter who works off a script, who shall remain unnamed. Plenty of those around. So the next step once you have someone say, yes, I want to work with you, is to have a proper onboarding process. So a structured process for new clients, because there's a whole new set of first impressions there, aren't there? They're now starting to see that they're on the inside now, and they want to see if the walk matches the talk. And that's crucial. So they'll be asking themselves, is what I'm experiencing here matching the promises I was made? You need to have a, an indoctrination process for a new client about, here's how it works. When you've got a question, here's um, the email address that you use. Here's uh, the phone number that you should call. Here's your main contact. Because it won't necessarily be you, will it? If you led the meeting and you've got a growing firm. So that indoctrination, which is essentially saying, here's how it will work. It's a window of opportunity. You've got to do it right up front. You don't get a second chance because the concrete will set in their mind. And if they think they can just bang off an email to you as the, the senior partner and expect a response within an hour because that's what you did through the sales process, that's a challenge and likely mismatch. So they need to have clear lines of communication with the different um, team members 
We recommend using a proper help desk system like Help Scout rather than email. We've written a number of blog posts on Digital First about why we think email is actually a poor tool to use in a business and its days are numbered in its current form. Another topic for another day, but look into Help Scout. Great tool to give you a unified inbox so everyone can see what emails are being exchanged with clients no matter who's the sender and receiver. The team member introductions about who they'll be dealing with and make sure you don't go too far on the high tech. Clearly you need to blend in the human touch, what they call the high touch as well. And that will result, that whole process, you'll end up with a really specific client base. So you'll have those ideal clients that you wanted in the first place, which therefore allows you to focus on what you love doing, the ideal service mix. You know, I know a lot of um, practitioners who are business advisors who get really jaded and are jaded by what they've been doing year after year and really, really want to, for the benefit of their clients, but for the benefit of their own brains and souls, want to do meaningful advisory work. So you can't do that if you don't have the right client mix who's receptive to it. So you'll get to a point where you will say no and refer on non-ideal clients. That's when you know your marketing's working. Working. You will have a consistent stream of inbound leads that are just warmed up, ready to talk, ready to meet, ready to buy. And the nice thing is when they come on board, they are what we call higher client share. Um, clients who want your advisory level work. Client share is a word we termed, which means how many services are they they're doing? As opposed to market share, which means how many clients do you have? A better business has fewer clients with higher client share because you've got you know, clearly higher revenue per client, but also higher loyalty and higher referral rates. And you know, you'll be lighting your fire, your team will be more satisfied. And with the way technology and legislation is going in the accounting, tax, compliance space, your business will be more future-proof and more valuable because you can say when the day comes to sell or merge, hang up the boots, you've got a far more um, valuable business with a far more robust business model and future. So there you go. That's the content marketing cycle. Um, next year, we are launching a brand new version of the Modern Marketing Academy, which will be structured around those 10 steps of the content marketing cycle. And we'll have a very specific um, implementation checklist for you to do under each of those areas. So that thing about not knowing where to start, it is so common. You will never have any doubt about the next step in your marketing because we're going to list it out exactly and it's going to actually keep tabs, a progress bar of your uh, progress, your achievements on each of those. And it will, the checklist will be um, multimedia, meaning uh, pictures, videos explaining the what, and the how, and then you can do it yourself, or you can go, no, Paradox, do that for me. So that's what's coming just in one small area of what we do. Now, open your calendar and just pencil in these dates, three dates I'm going to give you. On Monday, the 30th of November, and the very next day, uh, Tuesday, the 1st of December, in Brisbane, we're running a Marketing Automation Masterclass. So this is for accounting, business advisory firms who want to harness the power of marketing automation. So keep an eye out for um, emails from us about this. Um, we have an open door, so to speak, on uh, ticket sales to that. So that is going to result in you leaving with a very clear implementation plan of what automations, what marketing campaigns, what operational campaigns, what strategy, what client mix, what do we want to build and automate in our marketing? So that's a two-day workshop that is intended for um, the more senior people in the firm, but also anyone who's a digital native tech savvy who may help with implementation. Now, the next two events are in Phoenix, Arizona next year. Come fly with us. Um, we want to take a busload of people over to two events. The third one I'll mention first. Icon 16 is Infusionsoft's annual conference. Three-day event. I went along with um, friends last year, and I've been to a lot, as I know you have, business events, conferences, seminars over the year. And I don't know about you, but most of them are the same old, same old. Icon last year was the single best marketing conference that I have been to in my life. Um, and you know, apart from that, I'm also formally educated in marketing entrepreneur entrepreneurship as well. So uh, I've seen a lot, as plenty of you have as well. And there were a number of presentations across those three days that on their own paid for the whole trip. 
paid for the flights, the accommodation, the tickets. So the, you'll spend more on beer and wine than you will on the tickets. It's very affordable. So we're going to be promoting out a deal um, on those tickets. We're negotiating um, just a little incentive with InfusionCon to say, hey, what can we give our Paradox peeps um, a discount on the tickets? But we're going. We want to take a busload of people. Come with us. The who's who of the latest in marketing and innovation speak at Icon each year. Uh, there are keynote events in the main room with thousands of people, but there are lots of breakouts in specific streams as well. Fantastic. Now, the day before that, Paradox is going to run a one-day workshop in Phoenix to make sure that you're going to hit the ground running at Icon 16. So we're going to run a primer, bring you utterly up to speed on the latest in marketing frameworks, models, and automation, so that the next days you'll, you'll know, okay, I'm gonna to go to that Ryan Dice session, I'm gonna to go to that Clay Collins session, and um, also have some fun, we'll go out to dinner, have a few drinks, and you'll be mixing with the most progressive firms in your profession. So there's some dates. All right, apologies to go over time today. Couple of next step options for you before we go into question time. And Isabel, you keep an eye on those questions and unmute yourself. If you'd like to learn more about what we do, we have a very easy thing that you can do. You can request access to some videos that are not publicly available on our website. And you do that by going to our website at practiceparadox.com.au forward slash quick tour. And that will allow you to go through, watch those videos, learn about the Academy, learn about the article service, learn about our social media update service. There are a range of other things we do as well, but that's what we cover in the quick tour. Then you're welcome to submit a gap analysis questionnaire, and then let's have a web meeting. So that's one option for you. It's a good way to go, but if you've got something really specific in mind, you wanna do a new website, you want some rebranding, you know, you can skip through that if you like, and just go to our contact us page and book a web meeting or a phone call with us, or we've got a new tool there where you can request a quote. You might you know, want to know uh, what's the price for you writing an ebook for us, or uh, you might want to know, uh, you know what does it cost for you to help improve our Google rankings? Click request a quote, and that's a nice easy way for you to do that. All right, so I am just gonna have a look at what questions are there. MC, we... Hey, Isabel. Yeah, we have a couple of questions here. Brilliant. Hi, MC. Okay, I'm from Tanya Woods. She asked, uh, regarding blogging and articles, uh, I get differing opinions as to the optimum length a blog post should be. Any thoughts? Okay, so the optimal length of a blog post. Great question for lots of reasons because there are lots of opinions on this. Um, this is one of those questions in life where there is no one right answer. There are multiple right answers. And this is not to evade answering the question, but the answer is the blog post should not be any longer or any shorter than it needs to be to achieve its objective. So I know underlying your question is from an SEO perspective and there are certain opinions on that like 450 words or longer. And Google does tend to look for longer pages and which is why people say that. Now Google changes their algorithm every other week and they announce only occasionally major changes to it and they always give it a name when they change it. So those things shift anyway. But some of the best bloggers in the world do incredibly brief blog posts like Seth Godin. If you're not subscribing to Seth Godin's blog, you should. Seth um, Godin, G-O-D-I-N. His blogs are often, you know, one paragraph. And it's harder to write a really good one paragraph blog post than it is an 800 word one. But there's also some um, concepts of cornerstone blog posts which could be 2000 words, but they're really, really good and they're really, really specific on what they're talking about. Um, that's not your typical blog post, but we've got blog posts like that that send us traffic every single day. Like if you search on um, how to become a zero goal partner, that's a long tail uh, phrase that we've targeted with a couple of long blog posts. But if you want a number, I would say, you know, maybe target around 500 words to 800 words, but if it can be shorter, great. If it's starting to get longer and you think, mm, I'm losing momentum in this blog post. Maybe break it into three blog posts that are five or 600 words each. So thanks for that question. Next question is about... Another one of, yes, another one from Elizabeth. 
Um, can you please repeat the other apps you mentioned with Hello Bar? Okay, great. Um, I will do more than mention them. I'll also put them on our LinkedIn group. Uh, now, the LinkedIn group, uh, I'll, I'll put those URLs there. But to answer your question, Elizabeth, there was um, after Hello Bar, there was Sumo Me. So S U M O Me. Um, it has a tool like Hello Bar, but it's got a range of other ones. For, you know, pop ups, people consider pop ups evil. You know, browsers have pop up blockers, but there's um, behaviorally triggered pop ups that will only pop up based on rules that you set. So for example, you could say, this pop up to promote this lead magnet, this checklist, only pop it up once they've been on the page for 30 seconds or a minute, or only pop it up once they scroll to bo the bottom of the page, or only pop it up when they do an exit behavior, which is like their mouse moves out of the main window towards the tab and bam, the pop up comes. Some sites overuse those like Smart Company and others. They build their list massively. So Sumo Me, um, Pop-Up Domination, that one's a bit dated now. Opt-In Monster is another one. So they're the main ones. Oh, by the way, oh, look, I'll leave it for another topic for another day, but Snipply, amazing tool, incredible, brand new. Most people haven't heard of it. We're gonna be implementing that with our members that we're doing social media updates, curation for. Um, any other questions, Isabel? Thanks for that one, Elizabeth. Um, that's it, MC. Brilliant. Oh. Okay, great. Well, thanks, guys, for those questions. Thanks for um, staying with us, most of you. Apologies for going over time. Uh, reminder, if you want to get in touch, either just go back to our Contact Us page or our Quick Tour page. And Contact Us is easy to find. There's a big Contact button at the top of our web page. But this button... Just note that it's practiceparadox.com.au forward slash quick tour. No cost to go through that process at all, but allows you to evaluate what we do and allows us to make sure that there's a fit as well. So look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. And I look forward to seeing you, if you're not already a member of our LinkedIn group, um, I'll send a link out to everyone who attended that you can click, come through to that, and I'll share those links that I mentioned to Elizabeth. Bye for now. See you next time.